Welcome to the first codex. Uh, the speaker today is Hans Parshall. He's been a postdoc at Ohio State for the last three years, and he'll be starting at Western Washington University in the fall. Today, he'll be speaking to us about optimal line packings. Take it away. That's right. Uh, thanks very much, Dustin. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I am looking forward to having these sorts of talks be more of my life. Uh, seems to be what's happening. So I'm going to tell you something about optimal line packings, but before I do, I'd like to give you uh, some motivation for how these things work. Uh, so the, the beginning here is going to be a little bit about compressed sensing, um, just a very brief introduction. So the, the story goes that traditional MRI machines are slow. Um, and there are a lot of problems associated with this. Uh, one, one issue is, of course, the anxiety of being in a tube for a long period of time. And so here at the University of Virginia, it looks like they have a, or I, they, they actually do have a little toy MRI machine that has all the bells and whistles and actually lets you see exactly what's going to happen uh, to help alleviate any panic that you might have with going inside of a tube for a long period of time. And it's really important that you hold perfectly still in order to actually get the images exactly right. Um, and so no, no amount of movement allowed in holding position for a very long time, sometimes stopping breathing or even stopping the heart in order to get a perfect picture of exactly what you need a picture of. Um, and so this motivates speeding up MRI machines in order to avoid issues that are associated with this. Uh, the reason that traditional MRI machines are slow is because it used to grab every pixel much like what's happening on the bitmap on the left where it's literally every pixel is being stored. And so that's a fairly large file compared to the later compressed JPEG uh, that you see on the right. And what, what's funny about this is that MRI machines are slow because they're acquiring every pixel, but it's not that they actually retain them. It's much too much information to, to store. And so instead what they're doing is they're acquiring a bunch of data and then keeping only the bits that they need in order to hold on to the good enough image on the right. Uh, even with the video quality through the internet or what have you, uh, even on my end, I can't tell the difference between these two pictures. Um, so Donahoe put this in a pretty decent way back in 2006, asking why you would go through so much effort if you could just instead directly measure what you actually wanted. Um, and so addressing his question is probably the, that, that's roughly what compressed sensing is, is attempting to do here. Um, so how, how do we, what, here, here's a famous image from a 2006 paper of Candace Romberg and Tao where the, the goal is to recover the image on the top left. You should be thinking to yourself that that image on the top left is what you want to have access to, but you can't, but rather than grabbing every single pixel, maybe you only sample uh, some locations and that's happening in the Fourier domain on the top right. And 20 years ago, the state of the art involved projecting directly onto those samples. And if you only took the, the ones that you see, then you end up with this low quality, unfortunate picture at the bottom left, where if the picture that you're trying to recover is a brain and those little shapes are tumors, you're not going to see what you're looking for. Um, and Candice Romberg and Tao discovered that there was a rather simple approach to acquire the simplest image with consistent samples, uh, which again, I. I can't tell the difference between these two images. Unlike the JPEG story, that's because this is actually uh, the, the exact image in this, in this test case. Um, so if you like rounding to the simplest image is good enough. So this is all summarized in an article that I think is good reading, not just for folks interested in compressed sensing, but actually folks interested in the, where mathematics sits in the rest of the world. Um, so this, Compressed sensing technology has made its way into FDA approved MRI machines uh, by GE, Siemens, and I think, I think there's another company too. And David Donahoe shares his congressional briefing uh, in the AMS notices. And it's, it's a very interesting read from the perspective of you have to tell non-experts why math matters um, and not just the math that the non-experts can see. And th these are folks who pull the purse strings uh, and actually fund mathematics and so convincing them in an effective way. There's, a, there's an associated video too, if you're interested in his ICM address is uh, a really nice storytelling uh, with math, about mathematics. Um, and so this is sort of a, a bragging story at the end of how good it's done. Uh, and I think it's a really important read. So 
roughly compressed sensing, uh, the, the biggest idea behind it is that it's leveraging sparsity. Um, images and other natural data, when encoded correctly, exhibit sparsity. Uh, and so I want to make a definition of the sigma kn thing, where this is going to be k sparse vectors. These are vectors in Rn with at most k non-zero entries. And uh, you should be thinking of this as a union of subspaces. I've drawn sigma 2, 3 here for you. Um, so these are the vectors in R3 that only have two non-zero entries. These are the three planes that you see intersecting at the coordinate axes. And the, the overarching goal of compressed sensing, in order to make it work, you're, you're trying to construct short, fat matrices. So uh, you want to have, for D much, much less than N, you'd like to build these short, fat matrices. I'm going to call it a sensor here, uh, where you've got uh, data that you're actually observing. This is uh, maybe a phi times x, which I'm going to call y. So that's in Rd. And you want to be able to guarantee that this is determining a unique sparse signal x in sigma k. And uh, not only do you want to be able to have that x is uniquely determined, you want to be able to get it back. Uh, if you can't get it back efficiently, then there's not much hope uh, to, or, right. So you, not only do you want it to be uniquely determined, you want to be able to actually determine it in finite time. <laughs> so. The question you're hoping to answer is unfortunately an NP hard problem. Uh, you're attempting to recover a sparse vector given only this measurement phi x, and instead you could run a convex relaxation where you're trying to minimize an L1 norm subject to the constraint that uh, phi x is equal to y, some y that you're actually observing. So you're looking for x, of course. And Candace showed that if phi satisfies a property called RIP, then amazingly this convex relaxation actually solves the NP-hard problem exactly. Um, and so uh, I should tell you what RIP is, and you, you could introduce it with more parameters than I have here, but let's, let's roll with this. Uh, phi is going to be RIP when for all pairs of sparse vectors that are, uh, well, I, I think the quotes at the bottom are better, uh, where it, it's something that actually preserves distances between sparse vectors. You want to make sure that uh, phi x and phi y are, if x and y are pretty far apart, then phi x and phi y are still fairly far apart, but not too far apart. You're actually sort of preserving the distance structure uh, between these sparse vectors. Um, the, the same definition can be rephrased in terms of eigenvalues. I guess I should uh, say out loud what's happening here too. The, so phi RIP is, asking the same thing. I guess RIP up to parameter k, and that parameter k is part of the story. So RIP is saying that every submatrix of selecting so many columns from phi and then building the gram matrix, uh, so this phi k transpose phi k, look at those eigenvalues and ask them to cluster around one. Uh, and in, in this, for, for this talk, uh, by near one, I mean between a half and three halves is good enough for what I'm going to write down. Uh, RIP matrices, again, the ones that compressed sensing works for, they are not so hard to build if you're happy to work with randomness. Uh, and this shouldn't be too surprising in the sense that random matrices have predictable eigenvalues. If you wanted to build an RIP matrix, you could do it by drawing random entries from your, from your favorite draw random entries subject. So you could grab normal uh, entries, Gaussian normal, you could uh, draw plus minus ones appropriately normalized, you can draw rows out of a discrete Fourier transform matrix, there's oodles of examples along these lines. Uh, and the result at the end of the day is going to be that with high probability you've built an RIP matrix with this parameter k all the way up to basically d, ignore the polylog, uh, with k basically up to d which is the most that you could ever hope for. Um, but not long after folks started building these things, Tao said, well, okay, with high probability we win, but I prefer winning to sometimes winning or probably winning. I want to actually win. And uh, he asked how he would build explicit alternatives. And this sort of, this is, this is together with a, something that Victorson calls a hay in a haystack, which is a problem with probabilistic methods where sometimes you can prove that something happens with high probability, but actually finding something that does the job is uh, nigh impossible. Um, so it, it's as if you had a pile of haystack, uh, if you had a pile of hay and you knew there was a needle in there, 
the needle is the bad thing. You reach in, you grab for the, and you only pull needles every time you're yanking things out of this haystack. A bit of a hassle. So building explicit alternatives of RIP matrices that actually perform up to this level is part of the game. So uh, what's another way that you could build an RIP matrix with decent parameters? You could work with incoherence. And maybe the, maybe the question there is a little bit insulting. Uh, I, I know that everybody who tuned into this talk knows what the eigenvalues of a diagonal matrix are. And I, I hope that most of you also know that uh, a nearly a diagonal matrix also has eigenvalues that are nearly the diagonals of that matrix. Um, and this, this is quantified by Gershgorn's circle theorem telling us that the eigenvalues of the square matrix are contained in a disk centered at the diagonals with radius that's predictable based on the off diagonal entries of the matrix. Um, and so if you use this tool, if you build yourself a short fat matrix with unit norm columns and you measure the coherence, the uh, maximum absolute value of these phi i, phi j inner products, the the consequence that Gershgorn allows for is that phi is going to be RIP for every k all the way up to one over four times the coherence, okay, where the four shouldn't be taken too seriously. The point is, as you lower the coherence, the lower you can get that coherence, the higher you can take that parameter k, the better your matrix is in terms of RIP. Great. So this talk is about two separate but related things that can all be uh, related back to the prologue I've given you that feels long for a prologue. The, we're going to talk about finding matrices that minimize coherence, that allows for uh, best possible RIP guarantees from the Gershgorn estimate. And then we're also going to talk about average case improvements because even if you could do exact, if you could uh, minimize coherence in every case, it's not quite getting us up to the level that we'd like. Uh, so these are two, two different texts. And when I think about minimizing coherence, this, this coherence quantity, again, is down at the bottom. Uh, minimizing coherence, well, that's minimizing the maximum uh, of a cosine of some angles between some vectors. So in other words, I'm trying to uh, maximize the minimum angle between some vectors. So this cosine is flipping my maximums and minimums a little bit. But let me, let me go ahead and rephrase as we move into part one. So I'd like to start by talking about globally optimizing line packings. So again, I'm, I'm taking these unit vectors that would make up the columns of a, a short fat matrix, and instead I'm thinking about the lines that they span in R2. So let me rephrase this in terms of uh, line packing. How do we arrange n lines to the origin of RD so as to maximize the minimum angle? Uh, same thing as minimizing the coherence between any two lines. In other words, how, how do you optimally spread out lines? And so compressed sensing is one motivation. There are other motivations. Matt said something the other day that stuck with me. I'd like to see uh, some of these codex talks over the next, uh, however long we're gonna keep doing this, I hope for a very long time. I'd like to see even more applications of these optimal line packings, but I've listed a few more here beyond compressed sensing. Um, if you've never thought about this problem before, I hope you're thinking about it in R2. Uh, so if you're, trying to get a feel for it. You're trying to spread out lines to the origin of R2. And I, I hope that you feel that you could just spread them out evenly. That seems like the only thing that you would try. And uh, it feels obvious and it's correct. So I'm not trying to dissuade you of that intuition. But especially the first time I heard of this problem moving up to R3, I thought to myself, OK, so you do something similar. I just want to spread these lines out. How hard could that be? And it turns out that it's really hard uh, for up to eight lines, we know what to do. Beyond that, we think we know what to do, but proving optimality seems to be a big problem. Uh, it's, there's issues abounding. Um, but with only eight solutions to talk about, I can at least show you these solutions. And so let me go ahead and do that as best I can in this virtual environment. So you'll notice that I'm not showing you pictures of lines through the origin. I'm instead showing you pictures of points on the sphere, uh, antipodal pairs of points on the sphere. So what I'm thinking is that I've got lines that are going through the origin of R3. They nick the sphere at two antipodal points, and those are the points that I'm keeping track of. And then I'm drawing edges between those points on the sphere uh, to indicate which ones are actually achieving that minimum angle between points. So if you only had to do this job for three lines, uh, you're 
hopefully thinking of the orthogonal uh, coordinate axes or anything that you rotate from there. So I've got this spinning to try to give you some perspective. Um, and so for three, it's really not terrible. Orthogonal is the best you're going to be able to do. As you pack more lines in there, orthogonal is no longer an option. But uh, the first few solutions were shown to be unique by Fehe's Toth. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that the icosahedron vertices are what you see at the bottom left. And that if you delete a pair of antipodal vertices from that icosahedron, then you end up with the solution for five lines, these 10 antipodal points that you see at the top right. Um, so there's this phenomenon that sometimes objects such as the icosahedron are so dang optimal that you uh, try to remove a line from it and you're still looking at something that's optimal as best as it could be, uh, which is an interesting thing that's not just in this setting. Um, after phase thought, in 1996, Conway Harden and Sloan did uh, quite a few things. Among them, they came up with a lot of numerical solutions that folks believe are true, um, but they, they weren't able to prove that many of their solutions were uh, actually optimal. They did show that their solution for n equals seven lines was optimal, uh, but they didn't show uniqueness. Um, and uniqueness came only later in the work of Cohn and Wu, uh, like in 2012. So showing that that was unique was its own story. And then uh, not so long ago with Dustin Nixon, uh, we showed that the their purported solution is indeed a solution and it's unique, the only optimizer of this question uh, for eight lines. And I, I want to also observe the one that I'm looking at that's spinning right now, uh, wildly less symmetric than the ones we were looking at before. It's a much uglier configuration in more than one way. Uh, I really am not a big fan of how ugly that thing is, even though I spent a lot of time looking at it. Great. So what was the proof strategy for working with this optimal eight code in RP2, these uh, eight lines through the origin of R3? Well, again, we're, we're moving the problem to these antipodal points on the sphere and relating it back to a problem of uh, Thomas. I learned recently this is pronounced Thomas because it's Dutch. Some of you have heard me give this talk and I've said Thames very loudly and confidently, and I was wrong. The, the name is Thomas. So Thomas asked how you would optimally spread n points on the sphere. Forget about the antipodal condition. You're just trying to spread these points out on the sphere. Uh, and Thomas was a, was a botanist. He was looking as close as he could to pollen. He wasn't able to look as close as we can today. That's an actual picture of some pollen uh, over on the right there that is zoomed in quite a bit. And it really does line up with the solution to the Thomas problem. Uh, so there, there are solutions to the Thomas problem lurking on pollen grains right now, which I think is pretty neat. I've got a pile of pollen grain pictures, if that's what you came here for. I'm sorry, that's the only one I'm going to show you, but I'm happy to share more any other time. Uh, so to tackle the Thomas problem for uh, n equals 13 and n equals 14 points, Moosin and Tarasov for, came up with a computational strategy that turned out to be very useful. They enumerated contact graphs, those, those graphs that I was showing you on the sphere previously, these antipodal points with edges uh, indicating the minimum angle that you're maximizing. Uh, so th those were the contact ramps that Moose and Tarasov were able to enumerate. And then they came up with a clever linear programming scheme to be able to eliminate suboptimal candidates. Um, and there are pros and cons if you adapt this to the, the antipodal case that we're considering. Uh, one of the pros is that enumeration is no longer the bottleneck for us. But there are, there are new cons that come along with uh, trying to eliminate things. And I don't want to get too much into the details of this, uh, but there, there was success there. And I, I'm happy to chat about it with any, anybody who showed up for this. So uh, previously, before we worked out this optimal solution, the, the best known uh, coherence, well, well, the best bounds that we had on the optimal coherence was somewhere between 0.6 and 0.64759. The lower bound coming from a general bound of Levenstein, the upper bound coming from an explicit example of Conway, Hardin, and Sloan. Uh, and we, we show that the explicit example of Conway, Hardin, and Sloan, once exactified, is actually the, the optimal A code. Um, and I, I guess I should say that this coherence, it's not surprising to us at this point that this is an algebraic number, but we don't have a good explanation of what 
we should know about this algebraic number. This is some terrible looking polynomial. Uh, I don't know exactly what it means. I would love to know what it means. I think there's good questions lurking and what kind of algebraic numbers are we expecting for these optimal coherences? Um, that's a direction for future things. So that's all I wanted to say about the case of R3, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about some other specific cases. Uh, again, we're trying to maximize the minimum angle between a set of n lines through the origin of Rd. Uh, and if you're moving up beyond d equals three, then solutions are very well understood. Well, for n up to d, you can play the orthogonal game. If n is equal to d plus one, a regular d simplex is telling you where you should be shooting your lines through. But then, for n equals d plus 2, uh, the story is incomplete. Uh, there's been recent progress where you saw the solution for d equals 2 earlier. For d equals 3, this is something that Bayes Toth worked out. You also saw on a previous slide. Uh, Book and Cox gave an infinite family of optimal solutions. Uh, they, they prove a, a really great bound on coherence that's achieved for this infinite arithmetic progression of dimensions when you're fixing the number of lines to be twice, or sorry, two more than the dimension. And then uh, you notice this gap between four and seven that Dustin and I filled in recently, uh, working in dimensions five and six. So how did we get at this? Well, we, we started by rephrasing the uh, rephrasing the optimization problem, we're thinking to ourselves about the rank constrained elliptope, this END set that I've written there. So you should be thinking this is the set of gram matrices that could do the job. Uh, and by gram matrix, of course, I'm, I'm really looking at symmetric matrices with ones on the diagonal because I'm thinking about a short fat matrix with unit, uh, with unit vector columns. Uh, it needs to be positive semi-definite if it's going to be a gram matrix, and the rank shouldn't be too large if it's going to exist in the RD that we're trying to put it in. And minimizing the coherence is exactly the same problem as minimizing the maximum off-diagonal entry over matrices that sit inside this rank constraint flip um, And so it's not entirely uh, well, it turns out that this rank constraint lip top is a semi-algebraic set. So we, we have some structure associated with this. It, is defined by polynomial equalities and inequalities. That's what I mean by semi-algebraic. And to see that it's semi-algebraic, you uh, the, the rank constraint is equivalent to some vanishing minors. And the positive semi-definite constraint by Sylvester's criterion is equivalent to some principal minors being non-negative. Okay, so uh, determining whether or not a given matrix is in this rank constraint elliptope amounts to checking, uh, solving a system, if you like, of polynomial equalities and inequalities. So we should be able to use the semi-algebraic uh, constraint to our advantage. So uh, the first tool here is that Tarski and Seidenberg tell us that if you take a semi-algebraic set and you project it, you're going to be left with a semi-algebraic set. This, this sound, I like these sing-song sort of statements that sound like they should be true because that's how the words just sound nice together. But notice that if you eliminate the word semi or the prefix semi on both of those words, it's a big lie. If you take the unit circle in R2 and you project onto the x-axis, you're going to find yourself left with something that's definitely not an algebraic set. On the other hand, it will still be semi-algebraic. And so this is what Tarski and Seidenberg tell us. Um, if you want to compute semi-algebraic sets in a useful way uh, using this projection technology, uh, you could run something called cylindrical algebraic decomposition, which was started development in the 70s by Collins and has had a lot of folks work on it in special cases to try to make it as effective as possible. Um, and right, really the way to read uh, cylindrical algebraic decomposition is as practical Tarski Seidenberg. Uh, it's only so practical, but we'll get there. And, and I don't want to describe CAD at length, but I do want to at least give you the example of the familiar parabola in R2. If you smack it with CAD and you say, hey, I want to, I want to know first what's going on with the Y coordinate, then it gives you this sort of output uh, where you're, you're finding that you need Ys to be non-negative and then you have uh, unique solutions, or sorry, not unique solutions, but only two possibilities for what X could possibly be. Okay, so the, uh, and this, this is an algorithm that's built into Mathematica uh, and it gives you some output that 
only gets worse as you move beyond sets uh, more difficult than the parabola, but they're still readable. And if your goal is to take one of the variables that you're interested in and you want to project onto that variable and find out what its minimum is, notice that this is a, a cute way to decide that the minimum y value in a parabola is going to be zero. Okay. So in theory, this is great because CAD makes all of these problems uh, totally solvable. You can just go ahead and compute the optimal encodes by running CAD in the right way. Uh, but this doesn't actually buy us much of anything because it's unfortunately doubly exponential in the number of variables. And of course, I made the choice earlier of, uh, re of organizing the Y coordinate to be the thing that it reports first. And it's highly sensitive in terms of computations that you can set up to finish in 24 hours or computations that might not finish in my lifetime. Uh, I feel like both of those have happened with a similar problem with reordered variables. Okay, so it's not the most friendly. But it still turns out to be helpful here. Uh, Thickest, Jasper, and Mixon, three, three folks who are all watching right now, they uh, give us some structure for optimal grand matrices that are in the rank constrained elliptope when the number of lines is two more than the dimension of the space, the place that I would talked about making some progress. They, they tell us that the optimal seven codes in RP4, for instance, uh, have one of two flavors of structure. They, they might have six equiangular lines among them, which the theory of equiangular lines is older than I am uh, in a very rich theory. And so you can squeeze out without too much work exactly what you need uh, out of there. Optimizing over the set of equiangular lines is not so bad here. Um, and the, on the other hand, maybe you could represent it by a gram matrix of this form where you have an awful lot of variables. Uh, an awful lot, I guess, means four, but many more sign ambiguities than variables. Um, so I, I'm not going to try to count the plus minuses, but uh, just your, for every choice of plus minus in each of those entries, you're looking at a different gram matrix that you're trying to optimize over. Okay, so you're you build many, many small problems and then ask yourself, what's the smallest that mu could possibly be subject to the constraint of G being in this E75 guy. Uh, and CAD is too slow to minimize mu if you just feed CAD the problem as it stands. But if you work on relaxing to some well-chosen minors, uh, where well-chosen is more of an art than a science at this stage, then CAD will succeed and tell you exactly what the, what the best possible mu is. I again summarize in terms of coherence here. Uh, before we solved the problem exactly, we the best known was the lower bound due to Book and Cox, the upper bound again, an explicit example of Conway, Hart, and Sloan. And uh, again, the example of Conway, Hart, and Sloan is optimal, uh, and this process exactifies it. We find a not nearly as bad minimal polynomial. But again, why, why is it cubic? Is there a reason? I suspect there is. Don't know what it is, though. Okay, continuing. Uh, we also worked on this for what if you had eight lines in R6? Uh, and here you build the same sort of, uh, sort of gram matrices that you have to deal with. And unfortunately now, even, no matter what we tried, we couldn't get CAD to finish in the amount of time that I was willing to let it run. And I, I mean, there were Friday afternoons where I set it to run over the weekend. I show up on Monday and my computer is not telling me anything interesting and I'm not solving uh, hardly any of the problems, nonetheless, every sign ambiguity or every choice of signs in that matrix. So CAD is not the solution here. I, I, I don't know that there's much more juice if we, unless we specialize it in some way. Uh, a faster strategy that we came up with here was that we tried to apply uh, positive Stellan signs. So let me, let me tell you about this cool tool because it's worth knowing independently of the rest of it. Uh, pretend that somebody hands you a semi-algebraic set and your goal is to decide if it's empty or not. Trying to show that a set is empty is not so fun. If you're trying to show that a set is non-empty, you could just produce a member of that set. If you're trying to show that the set is empty, uh, you have to work uh, significantly harder, I think. So here's an example, uh, rather than giving you the whole story of what the positive Stellan sets is all about, uh, where I, I want you to be thinking that this is a lot like completing the square. Okay, so the semi-algebraic set in question is the set of x's and y's for which this f is non-negative and this g vanishes. And that set is non-empty and here's why. 
because if you take S1, which is a non-negative thing, plus S2 times F, which is a non-negative thing, plus T times G, which is a vanishing thing, again, non-negative and vanishing for X's and Y's in that set, then you walk away with a negative one. Uh, this is an algebraic identity that you can, once it's handed to you, it's not so hard to verify. Of course, the positive Stellenzatz is about how would I go finding these things? Uh, and the Stengel's positive Stellenzatz is roughly the statement that there's a sum of squares certificate, the sort of thing that you're looking at there that shows that that particular set is non-empty. Uh, if and only if that semi-algebraic set is empty, you can produce one of these certificates. And with semi-definite programming, you can, uh, put to, you can build yourself a numerical approximation to a certificate, and then you want to try to build an algebraic identity like the one you see up there. Um, I, I haven't talked to Prio or Sternfels about this, but I'll bet you anything that when they uh, had that one-sixth up there in the S1, they didn't see a one sixth from their computer at first. They saw a decimal expansion that they recognized as one sixth after staring at it for a while. And so with that one sixth, then you write down what you think it should be and you do this ad hoc rounding to some rational numbers and then you have an actual algebraic identity that serves as a proof rather than a numerical approximation to something. Uh, and I think one of, one of the most exciting things that Dustin and I worked out in here was really that we have this idea of an approximate certificate that suffices for what I'm going to call bounded sets. Again, you're, you're working with a set that's supposed to be empty, but by bounded, I mean if you can prove that if there's a member in the, of, uh, if there's a member of RD that's in that set, then it must not be too far away from the origin. Uh, approximate certificates suffice in that setting. And this allows us to just uh, quickly rule out all sorts of grand matrices that we couldn't touch with Ken. Um, and this, this is how we get at the, uh, the eight lines in R6 question. Um, and again, summarizing in terms of coherence, we're, we're looking at uh, lower bound from Buch and Cox, upper bound from example of Conway, Hart, and Sloan, and Conway, Hart, and Sloan win again. Uh, so looking at another one of these polynomials. Great. If you want to scale this sort of approach up, uh, the, the number of cases you have to consider grows uh, a little fast for my taste. I, again, the, what, what Dustin and I were able to do is handle less than a thousand cases after accounting for symmetries. Uh, you, you don't have to analyze every single sign pattern that I showed in those matrices. There are symmetries that you can use to help your life. Um, but trying to run the strategy for 600,000 cases is not going to happen. And that, that's after we applied whatever symmetries we had in mind. Um, so it's an open question what the best packing of 10 lines in R8 is and one that uh, I'd be interested in learning more about. So what else could we do? Well, so the, I think more combinatorics could lead to a smaller candidate pool. There, in, in each of these cases, there's some enumeration of candidates that you have to analyze. And uh, there's probably work to be done for if you had D plus, D plus three lines in RD. Um, we, we've thought a little bit about the contact graphs there. The numerical algebraic geometry improvements could maybe lead to faster, stronger elimination. I, I'm really interested in the idea of specializing CAD. I'm not a real algebraic geometer. But they're the people who really make this algorithm go. Uh, but I'd be very interested to know if you could specialize it to attack these specific problems. We, we have these relaxations that seem to be more of an art than a science at the moment, and I'd love to see that uh, shift closer to the science column. And I, I think that the algebraic, I know at least one algebraic number theorist who thinks it would be amazing to uh, really know where these mu's live throughout and try to analyze uh, what, what sort of interesting properties these particular algebraic numbers have. Okay, so if, if we had that information, if we could predict where these mu's were supposed to live, then we might be able to exactify line packings a bit faster. Okay, so this is a great time for a question. In fact, I've been sitting here talking to my computer screen, so I'm gonna ask the audience, please ask me a question. I wanna know that somebody's still there. When you're looking, when you're building these semi-algebraic sets, is yeah. it actually important that you have positive semi-definiteness of your matrix? Um, right, so is it important? I, you you I'm, need to have this in order to actually be looking at a gram matrix. Um, well, yeah. So I ask because I mean, you, I mean, you mentioned uh, force and my bound. There, we don't care about positive semi-definiteness at all. I see. 
it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't come into play at any point. All that matters is the rank constraint. And yeah, and, and I think looks, I, I think that that's is, does it matter? Yeah, years? and and I th I think that uh, the the answer is kind of no. I, I'm going to agree with you that that doesn't seem to be the issue. Uh, when I mentioned these relaxations. Uh, that we're running with, we, we tend to verify semi-algebraic at the end of the day, or sorry, semi-definite at the end of the day, rather than um, using that as a constraint. Especially CAD, I never found that adding semi-definite constraints to CAD helped it at all. Um, and I, I suspect that the same thing is true. Um, I'd, I'd have to reopen the sum of squares story to answer the question correctly, but certainly with the CAD situation, that, that seems to be the less important constraint compared to rank constraint. I agree. Okay. Thanks. And any other uh, questions, comments, thoughts before we break into something different, but related. Okay, well, thanks, Chris. I know you're here with me, and that's uh, that's more than nobody. So here we go. Uh, I'd also like to talk about sub ensembles of optimal line frames. So uh, many of us know uh, equiangular type frames. Here's here's the Welsh bound. If I, if I've given you a certain number of uh, lines in R D or an encode in R P T minus one, then we know that the coherence can only be so small. Um, and this this is well just found. I'm I'm not going to go through the proof in this setting, uh, but it's there in front of you. There's two inequalities uh, that when you analyze what it takes for those inequalities to become equalities, you walk away with two conditions that uh, respectively tell you about tightness and equiangularness. That's not a great word, uh, but if you're if you satisfy both of these conditions, then you're looking at equiangular type. Uh, so equiangular type frames are optimal line packings that meet this Welch bound upstairs. Um, and equiangular type frames are awesome. Uh, I, I think I'm preaching to the choir a bit, but here, here's one example of how you could build an infinite family of equiangular type frames. If you look at primes that are one mod four, you can build uh, what are called Paley ETFs by taking uh, signs, pluses and minuses that come out of uh, the Legendre symbol and building yourself a conference matrix. So you're going to take uh, you're going to take this sign pattern that you get out of the Legendre symbol. You're going to make that a row. You're going to cycle the row to build a five by five matrix down at the bottom right. You're going to pad with some plus ones upstairs and to the left and build this six by six matrix. And this gives you uh, a gram matrix once properly scaled uh, and adding ones on the diagonal for the icosahedron vertices that we viewed before. Uh, so this is an example of building something beautiful and geometric from number theory. Uh, I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, so this Paley ETF is gonna come back, but again, the, one of the points here is that there's this infinite family of ETFs that has these specific parameters. We're looking at uh, 2D lines and RD. Uh, so, uh, we remember that we, I started by talking about why you might care about this coherence business, and I mentioned it in terms of these RIP matrices. Uh, so the RIP working definition that we wanted to work with was uh, making sure that these eigenvalues were clustering around one uh, for these grand matrices of these sub collections of columns out of the line packing that you were looking at or the short fat matrix that you were looking at before. Uh, if you take the Gershgorin bound and you apply the Welsh bound and you, and you see what's the best that could possibly happen if everything is given to me, you're going to find out that the Paley ETF, all ETFs, you're going to, I, I guess it depends if the redundancy is fixed. Anyway, so the Paley ETFs for sure are satisfying RIP for K all the way up to, uh, well, square root of D. And square root of D, unfortunately, is still really far away from uh, D, D with a polylog, who cares about the polylog, that you could get out of randomness. So uh, even in the best case scenario, you're not going to achieve the sort of performance that we see with randomness with only this uh, coherence-based guarantee. You, you need to be able to do something more if you want to show that they're actually RIP uh, even higher up. And there, there's a belief, uh, the Paley RIP conjecture, I think is the right way to phrase this belief, that this, the square root bottleneck should be beatable. Uh, we don't know how to build, beat it for very many explicit examples. Uh, and ca can we find improvements for average case data? Uh, 
And so both of these are sort of the, the big overarching questions, and neither of which are going to be addressed anywhere near completely in the remainder of this talk, but two big questions worth being aware of. So I'll tell you about the existing bounds uh, and what, what we can say about them for sure. So if, if I hand you an ETF uh, and I apply Gersh Gorin, I, I have some range around one that I know that these eigenvalues that I care about must live in. Yeah. And the, again, the goal is to have these get as tight around one as possible because that would allow me to uh, bump up that K parameter uh, all the way up to D if life was good. Uh, and so Gershkorn gives us something. Trop tells us that for 99% of selection, so then, okay, so Gershkorn is telling us this for every selection of K columns out of the N columns that I have in front of me. Uh, Trop tells us that it, if we only care about most of the time winning, for 99% of co collections of K columns out of the N columns uh, that we have in front of us, the eigenvalues of the corresponding gram matrix are in a tighter range around one. Um, I, I say tighter because log k is smaller than k, or sorry, k log k is smaller than k squared, but there's that, that constant that's actually very large. Uh, so the, wh whether or not it's a huge improvement for reasonable sizes of k is its own question. Uh, but it's, it, it's absolutely good as k gets large. Uh, and then Heiken, Samir, and Gavish uh, in, a, in a paper in Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, they have extensive data about what sort of uh, ranges you should expect the eigenvalues to fall in. Uh, and they suggest that the, the, their data suggests that the log k factor is completely unnecessary provided you have k and d and n all uh, proportional to one another. Um, so I, I want to try to give you an illustration of those bounds. This is more important than the precise statements on the previous slide. Uh, I'm going to grab a Paley ETF with a specific value of n. Uh, and remember that, uh, so now I'm looking at 2D lines and RD, if you like. Uh, I'm going to select a random selection of columns out of this Paley ETF, this short fat matrix. Uh, about 2,000, exactly 2,000 of those columns. I'm going to fix that. And uh, the Gershkorn guarantee tells us that the eigenvalues have to be around one uh, in this red band that I've drawn here. The TROPS estimate tells us that 99% of those eigenvalues have to live in this band, uh, which is tighter, and that's pretty good. Um, and then if you look at the actual eigenvalues and you compute them, you find out that the truth is that they're actually all just sitting right there on one. So somehow the Gershkorn and TROPS seem to be not quite telling us as much as we uh, can compute for any specific example. Uh, I've run this experiment with lots of different ETFs and different sizes of Ks, and this, this is the sort of observation that Heikens and Gavish were excited about. Um, if you look closely at that histogram, and I guess I should say on this slide that this is honestly a histogram. I'm not trying to draw an illustration of what a histogram might look like. This is literally, I plotted all of those eigenvalues and they, they sit right there, and there's no a uh, little eigenvalue that's off to the side that you can't see. Uh, they really all do sit inside that range. And so if you, if you zoom in at these histograms, uh, which is what Heiken, Zemir, and Gavish did, you find out that you are looking at a vector distribution, if that's something that you can recognize by sight. Um, of course, they probably worked a little bit harder than just staring at them, but the vector distribution is what seems to be calling the shots. Um, and I'm, I'm not so interested in the precise uh, nonsense down at the bottom, but looking at the pictures, what I want you to get out of this is that vector distribution is sometimes symmetric, and that's nice, and sometimes asymmetric, and that's a bummer. And there's two parameters that are kicking around here, uh, and so there's an awful lot of uh, different vector distributions depending on the shape and size of the ETF that you're looking at, the number of columns that you're plugging. So their conjecture, one, one way to state it informally is what I try to do here, where uh, let's try to read it together. If, I, if I'm looking at a family of ETFs uh, that are growing, I'm thinking of N growing, and let's at least hope that the, the dimension that each of these ETFs is living in, that the N and D are related, hopefully the, the ratio of the two, the redundancy, is headed to a fixed value R. If you find yourself in this scenario and then you start drawing random columns, uh, so I'm, I'm drawing indice, random indices, uh, for which columns I actually want to pluck. And each of those indices are something, a column that I'm going to take with me. I'm doing this independently with probability P, and P is some range it's constrained to. As n goes to infinity, 
the empirical spectral distribution, the, the histogram for these eigenvalues, appears to be heading towards a vector distribution that is uh, parameterized by not the A and the B from the previous slide, but the redundancy and the probability that you're choosing with or telling you which vector distribution you should be looking at. Um, and with Mark Maxino and Dustin Mixon, uh, again, both here, they, we together show that if you, if you fix yourself to a situation where the redundancy is equal to two, uh, like in the case of these Paley ETFs, then, then their conjecture holds. Um, we're, we're able to show in this one case, which on the previous slide, remember that the vector distribution is sometimes symmetric. The symmetric case is the case in which we win. Uh, the asymmetric cases are the harder ones. And so let me tell you a few things about what made this more approachable than the full conjecture. Um, before I do that, I'd like to show you some histograms just to, so that you believe me. But the point is that this is an asymptotic result, but it's actually very good uh, already for very modest values of n. So I'm looking at n equals 10,000 here, and that's a histogram of eigenvalues. It's a vector distribution, and man, are they lining up. Uh, I'm playing the same game with some slightly different parameters. It's still looking great. Uh, even more of the same game. And then if I, if I bump the numbers way up here, if I, if I add some digits to my n and I take my probability very small and I'm still taking thousands of columns or about a thousand columns here, it looks like. Uh, you notice that, again, this, this is the exciting thing for compressed sensing. You've got these uh, eigenvalues clustering around one. Yeah, so this is great news if we could show that it's always holding and maybe not just in an asymptotic setting. So our proof strategy is the moment method. We, we try to show that, or we succeed in showing that the moments of the uh, empirical spectral distribution that we care about head towards the moments of the vector distribution. We uh, succeed in part because the vector distribution for the case we're considering reduces to the Keston-McKay distribution. So I'm, I'm looking at these three measures and I'm looking at those moments and I'm hoping the resolution is good enough. The Wigner semicircle law is everybody's favorite random matrix law uh, and its moments have Catalan numbers kicking around in them. The Keston-McKay law has these, uh, these Borel numbers or Borel, entries of Borel's triangle, which uh, this is the one time in my life where I had a bunch of numbers in front of me. I punched them into OEIS and that's how I learned what the numbers actually were. So I enjoy having that success story instead of just uh, OEIS telling me that my numbers were all natural numbers, which it has done before. And uh, the vector distribution is significantly more complicated. Uh, and one of, one of the things that bothers me there is that we used combinatorial interpretations of Borel's triangle to win. And uh, the, some of the numbers calling the shots in the vector distribution are these Nariana numbers where I have uh, less experience with those combinatorial interpretations. There's, uh, there, it, it's, if you like, a, a one step up in terms of generalizing Catalan numbers in some, in some sense. Okay, so there, there's a lot more to do here. The Hikens Mir Gavish conjecture really should be something that's considered and studied for R greater than two. We only handle the R equals two case. I don't have edge statistics for you. Uh, there, there were no sneaky eigenvalues outside of those histograms that were. Uh, that, that looked like they were far away from the distribution that I was hoping that they were lining up with. Uh, but I can't prove that to you for finite n. I, I don't have non-asymptotic guarantees. The, again, our theorem is asymptotic, but I think that uh, we, we care significantly about having something for finite n rather than as n goes to infinity. And it would be awesome to uh, rope all of this into some new compressed sensing guarantees. I think that's the, that's the ultimate goal here. Uh, the reason that I said that we should care at the beginning of the talk. Um, and just as a, at the end, I want to show you the compressed sensing with Paley ETFs actually works. Uh, I think that this is a nice demonstration of uh, a reason to care and a place that I'd like to end. So I have a particular grayscale image in mind. Uh, I'm encoding it as a vector in R, uh, nearly 800,000 dimensional. I take a Paley ETF, I, I apply a discrete cosine transform first. Uh, this, this is an innocent object. This is what makes JPEG compression go. And um, we're only going to observe the output of this uh, phi times X naught multiplication. So again, X naught is the truth that we want to recover, but we're not going to have access to it. I promise I'm not cheating in the demonstration that's about to happen. Uh, we're going to attempt to recover this original image in the usual way. Uh, this L1 minimization strategy. And there's a specific algorithm that turns out to be very useful here uh, that's iterative and exploits the fast forwarding transform. Uh, 
so let's take a look. So there, there's some things about this picture that uh, I want you to look for. Uh, does anybody see a car? Is somebody willing to admit that they can't see a car? I'll admit to not being able to see a car. Okay, so let's hope that even with the video, that after we run this, there's going to be a car. Here we go. Oh, no. The, oh, there we go. I don't know why it flashed at the end. I like the iteration of it better, right? And so this cleans up quite a bit. Of course, the, the compression here is only uh, two times because of the redundancy being two. And now do we see the car? I don't know if it's coming through on the video or not. I can see a car. Oh, yeah, Joey, we can the, see To the right car. of the entrance, yeah. Yes, that's perfect, yeah. So that's a, I like that party trick better when I have people in a room with me, but it was fun anyway. Thanks for playing along. Here's some key references. Uh, I think Donna has noticed his article is good reading for everyone. Um, the Ficus Jasper mixing paper is a great place to uh, dig into this business. And then we, uh, Dustin and I worked out some specific cases. Um, and Huygensbeer and Gavish, they're, uh, they, they have their PNAS paper. And then uh, with Mark and Dustin, we have the paper where we prove the first known case of their conjecture. Uh, it'll show up in constructive approximation eventually. Thanks very much for your attention. Appreciate it. And I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing so we can chat. That seems like the right thing to do.